Why do we seek to understand? Why do humans have an insatiable need to know how their world works? Because when we know the effect of every action, our world cannot harm us. Because when we know what strings to pull in just the right way, our world bends to our will. Because control is how we survive. So what would happen if the curious human race met a world that cannot be controlled and resists being understood? For Jessie Faden, the catastrophe she was brought to the oldest house to stop. For me, blue balls. Here's what I understand. I understand that control enjoys the bounties of boundless creativity. That's the reason why control is such a remarkable experience. Remarkable for better or for worse. Control's greatest asset is its setting. You don't see that often in the genre. You'll be hearing that a lot. The oldest house is the Manhattan-based headquarters of the Federal Bureau of Control, but it doesn't catch the eye of many a passerby. Only those who know it can see it, because the oldest house wasn't built by us. Some predict it's a conflux, a dimensional meeting point. Maybe we'll never understand it. No one knows who founded the Bureau, only that it's guided from the shadows by the Black Pyramid in the astral plane that calls itself the Board. Whoever it was chose an unknowable anomaly as the home for an organization which seeks to control the forces beyond our understanding. A federal headquarters, a prison for the paranatural, a conflux of realities. Does that make for an interesting setting? You bet. Good enough to carry a 15-hour game on its shoulders. You're damn right. The oldest house is designed as a metroidvania with a dash of souls on top. It's a dense, sprawling, and interconnected map with progression marked by control points and paced by the acquisition of clearance cards and objects of power. There'll be locked doors in the first floor that you'll open with a key from the fourth. You're looking at rich environmental storytelling, shortcuts, hidden locations, but what you're really going to be looking at is the screen. Because control is like nothing else. Being a place where realities unlike our own collide, nothing in the oldest house is predictable. You turn a corner, you're looking at the dust and stars of space staring down at a quarry. You take the elevator up into research, it's the sleek, modern, but slightly too grand to be natural meeting of marble and forest. Just underneath that quarry is a never-ending expanse of cavernous quadrilateral pillars. And only a few minutes ago, we transformed a room from a glowing red nest of horrific forces and illogical geometry to an empty office space with the bodies of workers arrested in stasis, chanting. The game's white, black, and red color palette set a tone that easily allows a distinction of what is corrupt and what is not. Those base shades dominate most of our reality. Space is black, stars are white. It's bleak, but it's true, appropriate for the contents and of the Bureau. Control is not just beautiful from an artistic and technical standpoint, but it is so appropriately unpredictable that it's capable of getting you around every corner in the game just to see what's been made of reality this time. The freshness of the setting pushes you through the halls. That's the merit of creativity. Though I'd have preferred slightly fewer big open concrete offices, slightly more space quarries. The journey through this incredible place is control. You need only bring up your map and compare how much has been discovered with what's left untouched to estimate how close you are to the end. Unlike a weaker Metroidvania, Control makes no point of having you endlessly backtrack to recycle content. Instead, you'll spend your time as you'd expect, pushing through from one control point to another, avoiding environmental hazards, solving puzzles, and killing anything that gets in your way. What's so special is that it does all of this without a single objective marker. It's a shock to the system when you have to get from point A to point B without a direct path painted for you. Through that, the excellent level design of the oldest house becomes integral to the gameplay. The lack of objective markers creates gameplay simply by forcing you to examine the world to find the way, rather than the mindlessness of following a UI element. Don't fret though, the level design is careful enough that you're unlikely to feel completely lost. When you're told to look for a way into the maintenance section, you have to listen out for Jesse mentioning an elevator, and look for the nearest elevator on the map. 
You'll consistently find directions given in diegetic signpostage to keep you on track, but those are only useful on the larger scale. On the smaller, things get more interesting. In the Rubber Ducky quest, and yes, there's a Rubber Ducky quest, you need a way into a sealed chamber. If we look, there's a door that leads in. So, bring up the map, and as we can see, there's a tunnel marked that goes right behind it. Okay, let's find the other end. We unblock it, but there's no tunnel. Until you look up. Levitate through, run past the mold, and that Rubber Ducky is ours. Ah, oh, f***. See how the lack of objective markers is the only reason getting here was interesting. Arguably, the greatest benefit of having such natural navigation is immersion. There's a point where you start referring to level design as world design, and I think the distinction, if you're willing to accept one, becomes clear when looping levels and unexpected interconnectedness come into play. Finding yourself on the highest level of the power plant after hours of absence, looking down, seeing the previous control points and the allies you fought with. It's a striking visual indicator of progress because it nails in the sense that this is a place, not just a series of video game levels. Navigating with the map, the signposts, and the verbal directions is just as immersive as is using clearance cards from the late game to open new areas in the early game. Throughout, you'll find a wealth of documents, audio logs, and strange environments that paint a picture of the purpose of every lap, the results of every experiment, the properties of every altered item. I was let down by how incredibly unprofessional the supposedly official documents look, but never by the stories on them. The oldest house is Control's greatest narrative tool. The world is the best of the story, in the same way it works for the Souls games. The unpredictable but predictably incredible visuals draws you through the corridors, the lack of patronizing handholding keeps you immersed, and in the same motion creates interesting gameplay. That's why the oldest house is Control's greatest asset. It wouldn't be a fraction of the game it is without it. But it does make one key blunder. In some misguided inspiration from Souls, Jesse will always respawn at control points. I'm failing to see how this benefits the game in any way at all. In Souls, it was to punish failure and encourage multiple runs of an area. In Control, enemies only sometimes respawn after you've cleared a zone, and it's effortless to get past them, so this is just… walking. The 30 second console loading times don't help Control's case. In fact, they just compound on how this spawning system robs important moments of their dramatic tension. At the end of an amazing side quest much later in the game, I started fighting the boss and then immediately proceeded to unceremoniously fall off a ledge. But instead of being spawned back into the fight, I had to repeat the entire scene leading up to it, including the boss's introduction, which even the Soul series is forgiving enough to avoid. The moment by then was lost, and Control gained nothing for it. No punishment, the control point was five meters away from the place I had to be. The game punishes itself. I'll also add that clearance cards aren't exactly an inspired way of breaking up the levels, but we didn't come here to play Office Assistant. We came to play with Jesse's lovely red hair, by means of self-levitation. Control is a weird and wonderful place, but it's closer to our reality than you might think. Do you believe in magic? Well, I'm not going to tell you that you should, but some people do. And many well-funded institutions have spent countless hours testing our perception of reality. For knowledge, or for war. Many of us might be familiar with the MK Ultra experiments, the basis for Stranger Things, where children were supposedly used to communicate with other… entities. Ingo Swan is famous for remote viewing, the ability to see without actually being there, which was purported to be correct around 80% of the time. Truth or a load of poppycock? People loved these new age ideas in the 90s. You had people spending their lives trying to find out what was in Area 51. You had the popularity of magician Yuri Geller, who now claims he's going to telepathically stop Brexit. You of course had the X-Files. I don't think it's a coincidence that despite being set in 2019, the oldest house only accepts technology from the 1900s. And I don't think it's a coincidence that many of Control's paranatural concepts are rooted in new age ideas or even scientific theory. Control's explanation of multiple realities is one Michio Keiku, co-founder of String Theory, brought to light himself. In his own words, We now believe that the universe is vibrating, and that there are vibrations of other universes right in this room. There are universes of dinosaurs because the comet didn't hit 65 million years ago. The wave function of aliens from outer space looking at the rubble of an Earth that was already destroyed, all in your living room. Except, we have decohered from them. We're no longer in tune with them, we don't vibrate with them. Again, I'm not saying you should start getting high on ayahuasca. I'm praising Remedy for taking a believable approach to the inherently unbelievable. The idea that altered items become altered because those items have meaning in humanity's collective unconscious sounds very familiar to the historically widespread belief that human energy is a physical thing, and that we make our gods by simply believing in them. 
which formed the basis of Neil Gaiman's American Gods. You can see that that's a far more acceptable answer to why SCPs exist than they're just spooky. Instead of gods, control has objects of power. We can see how these things would be so common within humanity's unconscious minds. By binding them to herself, they are the source of Jessie's power. The Astral Plane is an incredible place and I always enjoy the fantastic side quests leading up to getting a new ability, but it's surprising that such an immensely creative game would choose such mundane powers. Launch is little more than basic telekinesis. Evade is just a normal dash move. Seize is ripped straight from Shadow of Mordor. Levitate is nothing new. They're all perfectly implemented, but I couldn't help but be let down that this was all Remedy could come up with. The same issue extends to the campaign, which is easily one of Control's more major problems. Puzzles are fantastic, but if you're looking for the campaign to present unique gameplay scenarios, that level design I described earlier is your lot. Interesting uses of Jesse's abilities or combat encounters with a twist simply aren't there. One of Control's auxiliary, shall we call it, gameplay mechanics is launching a power box into a receptacle. There is never any interesting alteration on this, no timing challenges, nothing that rewards a good angle. You're holding and releasing in the same way at the end as you were at the start. By your 10th hour, you've launched more boxes than UPS. An exception to the rule, and an example of what I believe there should have been more of, is the Astral Fugue Encounter. This is a native predator of the Astral Plane, it has no relation to the Hiss. So appropriately, the rules of engagement have changed. The Fugue is invincible, but impacts can slow it down. If you want to get past it, you'll have to lure it into a trap. You start off desperately running around looking for anything you might be able to use until you find what looks like a chamber. There's a switch, but it's not responding. A little UPS work later puts the power on, now it's just a matter of speed. You bait the fugue into position, dash past it, slam the switch, and that takes care of that. Unique, memorable, slightly terrifying, but alone. This, along with a great mighty poo down in maintenance, are probably the only creative gameplay scenarios in all of Control's campaign. Disappointing. But for all of the gameplay sameness, I didn't find it boring me until well after I'd seen the credits roll. Wanna know why? Same reason I enjoyed Control at all. The oldest house. We've talked level design, but how could a setting influence combat? Remedy have built their name on innovative, action-packed third-person shooters that have consistently pushed the boundaries of in-game visual effects, from particles to the warping of time and space itself. So what could be more Remedy than exactly what makes Control so different from everything else? Your gun isn't your primary weapon. The oldest house is. Launch is. Damn near anything in the oldest house can be torn from place and tossed at your enemies. Grab a forklift, tear a bit out of the floor, Control will continue to surprise you with just how much of a tosser Jesse is. Any inclinations you might have to rely on the service weapon are shut down by the total lack of a reload button. It takes quite a while to get that reflex out of your head, but once it's gone, you'll see why. When you combine cooldowns with a shared ammo pool between every weapon form, it's guaranteed that there'll consistently be times at which you have no means of firing the service weapon. And so, your focus moves over to launch. It'd be mistaken to assume launch is the equivalent of a single weapon type. It's far more nuanced than that. Consider that the object you plan to launch comes to you first, and if it makes contact with an enemy on its way, that's a hit. By subtracting the need for the object to slow down then, you can make launch an effective close range option. In the same way, you can also double up on damage. If I had an enemy in front of me, I could select an object behind them, hit them on the way, then release when I have it hovering. Two hits, one object, if you're willing to risk the time taken by adjusting angles or selecting appropriate objects. There's some decent depth in that alone, but with the right angle you can even hit multiple enemies at the same time. Two birds, one fax machine, that's what my mother always said. Other abilities lack the same depth and the same usefulness. One of Control's best design ideas was having movement be the best way to avoid incoming damage, and combining that with enemy health drops. You want more health? You have to go to where the enemies are, encouraging a deeply aggressive playstyle. That, and the fact that Control's kinda easy, makes shield pointless. There's no skill to its use either, even with the burst. Seize, which is also rarely used because the game's easy, is just holding F to make the game easier. There's skill in finding a position to hold F without being shot, but that's not exactly riveting. Evade and levitate improve things. You'll be dashing a lot, movement is your life support, and it takes a good amount of energy to pull off. So balancing its use with launch's use is important. You don't want to run out of energy, because that results in the slow red recharge rate where you're locked out of ability use. It's simple depth through management. And finally, levitate. You exchange escaping ground level for a slower speed. This rarely matters though. The real draw is the ground slam. You spend all your energy on a super powerful AoE. Complete energy loss means no evade, so you have to be smart with where you use it. By considering sightlines and cover at your destination. A cool combo is levitating for only 
only a moment and then instantly slamming out of it to clear any enemies in front of you. There's a lot to get out of these abilities, but with a mundane selection, two of them being rarely useful, and only a decent pool of depth collectively, I gotta say, I think Remedy could have done a lot better here. Now of course, most third person shooters rely on the uh, shooter part of that description to make combat exciting, but not control. The service weapon probably worried people before launch. You only get one gun in control? That's right, five forms. And you can see for yourself, visual variation was not a problem. Cool idea, but are these five guns any good? Short answer, no. Long answer, coming right up. With the exception of Pierce, they don't feel impactful enough. In a game where your go-to attack is yeeting a vending machine like it was fired out of a cannon, guns have to compete. They don't. Enemies aren't torn up into some brutal red mist or reduced to a bad Swiss cheese cosplay. There's just this strange dimensional warping. Of the five total, you're allowed two forms selected at a time. It's no surprise I stuck to pierce and charge for most of my playthrough just to make firing my gun somewhat meaningful. But I wouldn't have much reason to switch to anything else regardless. I don't think Remedy thought these weapon forms through. Grip is your standard pistol, Shatter is a shotgun, Spin is a machine gun, Pierce is a charged precision shot, and Charge is a light rocket launcher. First problem is that Spin and Shatter feel far too close a niche. Spin's bullet spread is so severe that anything but point blank will result in wasted shots, so it's a strictly close range option. Shatter is also a close range option, because it's a f***ing shotgun. So which do you pick? Spin dumps all its damage potential into an enemy far quicker than Shatter. So spin for single target, shatter for multi? Uh, no. You'll never have spin and shatter on at the same time because that's insane, so you'll never have that choice. No one's gonna go into their inventory to switch out shatter for spin as soon as they get the damage sponge on its own. Second problem is that spin and shatter exist. You have three abilities for close range, launch, shield burst, and your standard melee. Why sacrifice other weapon forms to get a shotgun if you'll always have those three? Well, it's not always balanced like so. You'll unlock Shatter well before Pierce or Charge, and it's unlikely you'll get Shield Burst at all. I can name a number of times when Shatter came in handy, but I can't say they justify two close-range guns in a game with only five. With Grip, Pierce, and Charge remaining, we aren't left with much of a choice at all. It's no surprise that the deepest two of those three are the ones I went with. Charge is best used as an A- AOE. So you want to time your shots and judge whether or not a target is worth the instant release single shot or the charged multi-shot. Angling comes into play too. Since the gun is so inaccurate, it's often to aim for the enemy's feet or shoot downward from levitate. Pierce isn't quite as layered, but it overpenetrates, therefore rewarding good angles. The service weapon is beautiful and the gunplay is smooth, but it's poorly balanced and sadly underwhelming for a Remedy game. I expected more from these guys, because they know what they're doing. Remedy is a high bar. The service weapon is deeply flawed, but it's no failure. When it comes to enemy design though, I'm not talking in relative terms when I say it's crap. Let's get this out the way. The AI is competent, don't expect to be impressed. It's the enemies themselves that are the problem. The vast majority of the Hiss population are standard soldiers. You will be intimately familiar with their attack patterns only a couple hours in, which is of course, shoot gun. Some of the Hiss are shielded. It's pretty clearly marked with either a swarm of rocks or a vivid red shell. The idea is that launch is effective against shields and the service weapon is effective against health. That's not really the case. Launch is effective against everything. This doesn't mean prioritize bullets over launch against unshielded enemies, it just means don't waste bullets on shielded ones. Having those rocky looking shields is the big fat guy's unique ability, but it changes nothing. The recharge rate only encourages you to focus them down, which kind of undermines the whole appeal of a dramatic final encounter when the game tries to pass a named version of it off as a boss. The first time Control pulls that trick is with Mr. Tomasi, who is a massive wanker. He's a copy-paste of your standard flying enemy. They aimlessly hover about and occasionally grab a couple objects to launch. That gives you a window to cancel it by forcing them to evade with a launch of your own. Problem is, the amount of launches it takes to deal damage seems completely random. Sometimes they'll dodge four objects in a row, sometimes you'll hit them on your first try. It'd be horrendously frustrating if the game wasn't so easy. The few times the game isn't easy, you usually have one of these f***ers to blame. Let's call them creepers, because they're hiss, they explode, you'll never see them coming, and they're going to ruin your life. 90%. 90% of your health bar is how much these second-rate ISIS pricks will take away when they pop up into sight and blow you away with no warning or hope of escape. It's so hard to see such a brutal loss of health coming, which creates a vast difficulty spike on the few occasions you'll cross paths. The strategy for dealing with these guys is madly spamming the launch button whenever you get a glimpse of them. Funny, because that's exactly what I'm getting at. 
Control's enemy design is garbage for a number of reasons, but top of the lot is that they entirely fail in encouraging different approaches. There are no interesting decisions, no tactics to speak of. Though the Hiss Cluster is best dealt with by a ground slam, not one other enemy encourages anything other than spamming launch. The less threatening suicide bombers, a launch will one-shot them. Your standard foot soldiers, you guessed it. Shields? Launch. The big trooper guys, launch until you run out of energy, then empty your service weapon and start launching again. The effectiveness of launch doesn't mean you'll never use the service weapon or melee, it just means as long as you have energy, which rapidly increases in pull and recharge rate as the game goes on, you won't have a practical reason to. You can waltz through encounters by spamming E. Two of the enemies have bad mechanics, all the shields add exactly nothing to engagements, the rest are boringly uninspired and every one of them does close to nothing to vary the fight. I was gravely disappointed in how difficulty was handled in Control. Throughout most of the game, Control is a cakewalk because the strategy is as simple as spam launch and keep moving. Which makes those times the game brings out the creepers, like in that second Tomasi fight, so stark a contrast. Science can't explain what Remedy were thinking with the Hedron encounter, and not even God knows why there's no difficulty slider. I'm being serious, there's no slider. Why? A patchwork solution would be weaker enemies having some manner of protecting themselves against launch, and creepers not being such pricks. What this game truly needed, though, was a total overhaul. When a single enemy faction from Destiny is more effective than your entire roster, you've got some thinking to do. Enemy design is a mess, there's no question, but with fun abilities and a decent weapon, is Control's combat good enough to last the 15 hours? I think so. Not all enjoyment is mechanical. Movement being so vital in combat grants this gameplay a great deal of momentum. And that's significantly compounded on by how visceral Jesse's abilities look and feel. You wouldn't question that Control's launch is exactly what it'd be like to body someone with a forklift at 300 miles an hour. Combat is so consistently entertaining because it feels so consistently good. Unsurprisingly, you have the oldest house to thank for that. Powered by Remedy's Northlight engine, these are the best destruction physics I've ever seen outside of a Red Faction game. Most objects you see are subject to some manner of cosmetic or geometric destruction. Chuck something heavy at a wall, you can see the impact crater. Keep going, sometimes you can tear free a part of a weakened concrete slab. The distinction between what's fully destructible and what's purely cosmetic is typically obvious, walls can't be broken through. But even after I'd beaten the game, I still found myself surprised at just how much I could wreck. Wow, these concrete tables are entirely destructible? Yes, they are. Almost anything you'd find in an office, from a drawer to a projector, can be launched. But even the things you can't pick up can be destroyed. Paper flies everywhere, splinters blast out from broken wood. You can pick up fire extinguishers, and it's most impressive when they paint the walls white. I imagine Remedy scoured every bit of every level just to make launch that much more visually impressive. The artifact cabinets outside Parapsychology? You can tear that object out of its holding, creating this gorgeous shatter. Most objects you'd expect to be able to launch, you indeed can, but sometimes, like in a huge pileup, they pull a smart little trick. They scatter the launchable objects within the visually identical non-launchables. It gives you the impression that they're all physics objects, when in fact only a few are. To save on resources, I suppose, but it's not like the engine can't handle it. You can reduce a clean room into a ruin without risk of bugs or crashing. Through this, battles feel real in a way few other games can hope to match. And the benefits are twofold. If you're getting frustrated, there's no reason to bounce your controller off a wall, chuck a fridge through a shed. One of the most immersive touches in the entire game is the way physics objects react to Jessie herself. Levitate emanates a force that'll knock smaller objects out of place, and the evade's aggressive motion destroys nearby objects, simulating air pressure. Doesn't stop there though. Evade will even allow you to crash directly through any destructible object you please. I don't need to explain how good that looks, but it's not perfect. While the objects break in the correct direction, they don't explode outward as they would if they were actually hit with that much force. There also appears to be a buffer issue. Sometimes the object disintegrates noticeably later than when Jesse goes through it. Despite those nitpicks, the destruction physics are simply masterful. And that's exactly why I found myself frustrated when the visual effects got in their way. Too often, particle effects such as dust and that weird dimensional warping you see near the hiss completely mask what's on the screen, including Jesse. I think these should have been dialed back significantly, because it's watching things and people break as you fire an office printer up their asses that gives the combat so much impact. That is what makes me want more, not clouds of dust. Do you know what this reminds me of? You just might if you're a channel regular. 
Fear. Both are about a government-funded organization that deals with the paranormal. Both have you fighting against forces beyond understanding. Both can be remarkably weird. Both are set primarily in office spaces. Both have visual effects so cutting edge that battles leave a striking mark on the world. And Control is the only game I've played since Fear that gives away an enemy's location with Shadow. Curious. There's no denying that Fear is part horror, but there's plenty of denying that Control is too. I've heard Kotaku, even Courtney Hope, talk about Control as a horror game. But if you go in expecting that, you will be disappointed. The soundtrack combined with the hiss chanting does a fantastic job at creating an unsettling atmosphere. You'll rarely feel safe in the oldest house, but scared? No. Though I must say I respect the attempts. Threshold kids? Whose twisted mind is responsible for this? And Christ, those mannequins. I am mortally terrified of weeping angels, which believe me, is quite the bias. So when I found a mannequin in the Prime Candidate program staring at me from across the room, I was unsettled. When I approached it, and a hundred of the f spawned behind my back, all of whom turned to stare at you whenever you look away, unsettled wasn't the word that came to mind. I gotta admit, I didn't expect that a fridge would attempt the same thing. Weeping Angels and SCP-173 oddly came out around the exact same time. And though the angels were penned before 173, it's impossible that either could have taken inspiration from the other. But it is clear that the killer fridge here in the Panopticon is an overt reference to the SCP universe, 173 particularly. Secure, Contain, Protect. These are short horror stories written in the form of an official document discussing the containment procedures, background, and properties of various paranormal objects. I was actually approved as a writer for the SCP website back in 2015, so it was really special to see Control go this far with it. The Panopticon is the C part of SCP. It's the containment facility. We see tens of objects all locked up. But sadly, few documents explaining what they are, until we find a man begging for help sitting inside a containment cell. If he blinks, he dies. Fridge duty is supposed to be shift work, but when the hiss attacked, Philip was left trapped. His eyes hurt, he can't hold on for much longer. I guess no one at the FBC figured out that you can blink one eye independently from the other. Sadly, we can't get to Philip by the time he blinks, so now it's just Jesse versus a fridge, which is near the top of the long list of things I didn't expect when I bought this game. In an attempt to cleanse it, you're transported somewhere that looks like the astral plane, spoken to by something that sounds like the board. But it's not. It's the former. One of Control's few unique bosses. It's a good fight, a brilliant side quest, and a fantastic homage. But scary? Not at all. Even in directly adapting SCP, a horror subgenre, Control fails at fear. The mannequins raised my heart rate somewhat, but that's one occasion in one side quest. Terrifying and interesting is a ruthless combination. It's a shame Control never went far enough. The comparisons to fear just never end, it's almost paranormal how many similarities these two have. Because just like fear, Control is cutting edge. The first fear was the crisis before crisis, it was the go-to benchmarking game before the never-ending memes arose in 2007. And now we have Control, with immaculate facial capture, among the greatest destruction physics in a decade, spectacularly detailed environments, and the best implementation of real-time ray tracing ever. This is the bleeding edge of lighting technology in games, and it is beautiful. But it comes at a cost. One perhaps it doesn't deserve to pay. On DirectX 12, Control suffers frequent stuttering in combat. I'm talking 80 FPS average dipping down to 3 for a second, it's not pretty. DirectX 11 has no such problem, but that comes at the sacrifice of ray tracing. A sacrifice, to be fair, I'm sure most people will be happy to make. On console, however, things are downright ugly. You're looking at 720p on Xbox One, 900p on PS4, and that stuttering is far more serious when it recovers only into the high 20s. Often, it never does, the game just chokes. If things are too hectic, and that's often in control, you're looking at entire encounters in the low teens. I simply cannot recommend this game unpatched if you're on a standard Xbox One or PS4. Unless you're so pumped for this game that you're willing to tolerate combat that chugs like Thomas the f***ing Tank Engine. And with due warning given, let's delve into the next curious similarity Control has to Fear. Both Control and Fear did something remarkably unique. Fear combined action first-person shooter with horror. Control combined action third-person shooter with a new weird mindfuck. Control is something we haven't seen before, and it will stay with me forever because of that. But like Fear, Control sometimes rides solely on the benefits of being the first. 
behind that coat of paint is sadly rather hollow. The greatest benefit of Control's creative weirdness is that it is entirely unpredictable. So even if you don't understand anything, or the characters aren't grabbing you, there's absolutely no chance you'll be able to guess what's round the corner. That is engaging. We like to check out of certain stories because we've seen it all before. We know what the writers are going to do before they've done it. You have not seen Control before. Everything here is fresh. And that elevates even the worst of things. Naturally, questions never cease to be asked. You'll find yourself clawing for any semblance of an answer. Excellent cinema techniques are incredible to look at, but vague, allowing us to look for the truth through representations of the larger forces at play. I never could have guessed that we just failed to save our guardian angel Polaris from the hiss. Even after the immense battle to stop them, Hedron just unceremoniously falls to pieces, leaving Jesse unprotected. Guess she's dead then, game's over. The credits roll, but just before I could finish calling the cops, we're suddenly doing office work. We're clearing coffee cups, we're photocopying documents. The game's insane. You'd never think that a mysterious dream space motel would act as a dimensional junction. Or that Artie, the janitor, can talk to trees. It's not such a surprise then, that with all this weirdness, Control's story feels remarkably unstructured. Getting from any one major plot point to the next is like trying to walk a cat. Let's take the ordinary research area, where we learn that the hiss originates from the slide projector, to the slide projector lab, where it's supposedly located. First, you have to journey all the way to the ashtray maze and go through it before you realize it's broken. Then, you get a call from Artie telling you how to fix it. So you go down to Artie's office in maintenance, but he's on holiday. Typical. Except, you can see his holiday. You have visions of beaches and the sun. You follow Artie's Snapchat stories through maintenance, past the killer mushroom people, into the Ocean View Motel where you've got to get rid of the Great Mighty Poo again, then go through the janitor's door into Black Rock Processing, fly over Black Rock Processing, dive down an elevator shaft, call a cable car as hordes of hiss attack you, dash yourself into the car, ride through a bunch of strange cavernous pillars over to solid ground, check out Artie's psychic holiday again, looks like he's been to a forest too until he pulls you into the Shadow Realm to give you his cassette player, which is apparently the key to the ashtray maze. Good, that's one problem dealt with. You go to the ashtray maze, whip out your playlist, and fight through an ever-changing labyrinth for the next 10 minutes with Artie's hardcore rock music in the background. It's called Take Control. Very funny, Remedy. Next, you cross the fire break that leads into dimensional research, which is only the area that the slide projector is at, so you go looking for it. You find where it's supposed to be, but it's not even f***ing there. You gotta head into Dr. Darling's office, and then you hit the Polaris encounter. It's taken that long to get from major plot point A to major plot point B. And plot point B isn't even what we came for. That's the result of this game's engaging unpredictability. And it's so entertaining all the way through because the world that we're discovering tells its own stories. But keeping me invested in any particular goal is almost impossible when you're getting distracted like a cat in a supermarket. It's the antithesis of narrative tension, and you can assume this template applies to the overwhelming majority of the story. Characters suffer too. Jessie's primary goal is finding Dylan, so I can't believe that when she's standing in front of the person who could help her find him, she's completely okay with going on a life-risking wild goose chase for some rocks. Her believability is sacrificed to accommodate the plot. Once you take away all those distractions, Control is left with a wafer-thin plot. Jesse arrives at the oldest house, guided by Polaris, each having their own reasons for coming. Jesse's is her kidnapped brother. A short while later, you find the service weapon near the previous director trench's corpse. Through touching it, the board appoints Jesse to director. You find Dylan, but he's been corrupted. He tells you that the source of the hiss is the same slide projector he and Jesse played with as kids. Jesse, target in mind, goes looking for it, but instead finds Hedron under attack. Hedron is Polaris, which is why it wanted Jesse at the oldest house at this specific moment, to bring itself a savior. So much for that. With Polaris dead, Jesse is taken by the hiss, but somehow a part of Polaris survives within her. She cleanses herself and prepares to hit the hiss at the source, but Dylan is already there attempting to corrupt the board. The board gives Jesse a Scooby snack, Jesse cleanses Dylan, which puts him in a coma, and then decides to accept her position as director. The end. After having spent the entire game assuming all the threads would come together, nothing is answered. It's a 15 hour game, and that's all that happened. Why is Artie capable of reading minds, teleporting and psychically communicating? What are his true motivations? What is the board? Why do they want the Bureau to exist? Does it have something to do with the board of directors? What is the astral plane? What happened to Darling? Does the Hiss seek anything but propagation? Is it sentient or merely a viral resonance? 
Why are there odd drawings on a pillar when you get Artie's Walkman? What is the slide projector? Where does it lead? Why does Artie call you Percolé, the finish for Devil? What is Polaris? What is Hedron? If Hedron is a resonance like the Hiss, why is it contained inside a... Hedron? Why did Hedron die even after we killed all the Hiss attacking it? Why didn't it protect Dylan from the Hiss? How could Polaris survive the destruction of Hedron? How can Trench talk to us through the hotline if he's dead? Why do we keep getting flashes of characters staring at us? What do the Astral Fugues want? What is the city in the Black Rock Threshold? What is the former? How is it related to the board? How is the former's realm related to the Astral Plane? Why did it attack us? How is it related to this fridge? If the Ocean View Motel is a construction of Jesse's memories, why is it the same for everyone? Why is it even there? Why do you have to pull a light switch three times to get there? Why doesn't Jesse react to all this crazy shit like a human being? Why do the Hiss say what they do? Why are the game's unique bosses relegated to side missions, leaving the final fight only boring waves of hiss? Are you getting bored yet? I am. You might have noticed sudden flashes throughout this video, images that didn't seem to belong. Wanna know why I put them there? Same reason Control did. Why not? It's so vague that you don't question it only under the assumption that it might mean something and you just don't yet understand. I don't think we're ever gonna understand all of this. Well that makes two of us. The answer to all of these questions and more is fuck knows. There are no answers. Control only asks questions, leaving you with blue balls that put Neptune to shame. Why do I get the feeling that's because no one knows? You didn't answer any of the questions. If I had to paint Control's never-ending obfuscations in the best possible light, I would say that Control is about accepting that there are some things we, as humans, cannot understand. We have to live with that. And people who try too hard, who go too far to control powers beyond their ken, will fall down to earth and die like Icarus. Perhaps I'm just rationalizing. You can't just go up to your local drug dealer, buy some top of the line DMT and write a book about your trip thinking it's a work of genius because it's about making no sense. I'm not saying that's what Remedy have done here. I'm saying that's what I hope Remedy have done. Because otherwise, they've intentionally written a poorly structured, incoherent mess of a narrative, and just banked on vagueness and the fact that no one else has done it. Personally, I have my doubts. If that was the game's message, then it makes no sense for Jessie to accept her position as director of the organization the theme supposedly speaks against. Nor does the board controlling the FBC from the shadows. Surely the board is among the forces beyond our ken, yet it guides and empowers those it appoints director. It is seemingly in full support of the FBC, it might have even created it. By no means does a story have to stick to some preordained rules to be good, it doesn't require a three-act structure or subplots, but those guidelines are there for a reason. Typical pacing I can live without. But where's the stakes? Where's the characters? I like Jesse Faden for the same reasons I like Alex Mercer. That instantly recognizable, iconic design, and her being a microcosm of the entire game. She's thoughtful, introspective, and the puppet of a force she can never hope to control or understand. She's like a personification of control, and that allows me to place my feelings for the game into her. Thankfully, technology has improved in the 10 years it's been since Prototype, so I can't just say Courtney Hope's voice acting is fantastic. Because Courtney Hope's acting is fantastic too. Whatever face cap technology Remedy used captures all of Hope's subtle movements perfectly. There was even a point where I couldn't tell the difference between the live action footage and the in-game render. Those are the reasons I liked Jessie, but sadly that's where the praise ends. She and the overwhelming majority of characters in this game are as compelling as your average parsnip. Artie is interesting and Darling is funny, the rest are almost unsettling, because they're just normal. Other than Langston, they're these perfect images of what a good human being looks like. Strong, determined, intelligent, resourceful, useful, kind, accepting, understanding, with a light-hearted sense of humour. Perfect skin, perfect hair. Underhill's rude, but to me they stuck out like sore thumbs. Who could be so conventionally good in an organization like this? A secret federal division that fights extra-dimensional forces inside an invisible Manhattan building. They're as close to real humans as the Hiss are, in both form and function. They don't move, they don't change, they don't do or say anything beyond their function as exposition bots, each one delivering background information with marginally different personalities. Pope and Arish had me Jesse Faden in and out of a f***ing coma. As for the stakes, of which there are none, we first have to understand that there are two types. Public and personal. Public stakes are what hangs in the balance for society as a whole. Personal stakes are what hangs in the balance for the relevant characters. 
Control's public stakes are that if the Hiss aren't defeated, the world will be absorbed into their collective. But the problem is, we don't care about the world. We barely even see it. And Jessie doesn't seem to give a crap either. The personal stakes are of course Jessie will lose Dylan if she doesn't defeat the Hiss. But that isn't effective, because up until we meet Dylan, we know nothing about him and therefore don't care, and after we meet him, he's already lost to the Hiss. We have no idea whether or not he can be cured. The idea that his fate actually hangs in the balance is only introduced when Jessie makes the attempt. Until then, we're in the dark. In that, Control has no stakes. We don't care who wins. That's the silver bullet. Control's story is interesting because its world is interesting. It's engaging because it's unpredictable and utterly, utterly tantalizing. Creativity made this narrative not boring, but what I assume are the consequences of Magic Mushrooms made it a letdown anyway. Nevertheless, Jesse's work is not over. After the credits roll, the game tells you directly that as long as any hiss remain in the oldest house, the threat remains. As the willing director of the FBC, you get a suit, but anyone who continues to play in this is a criminal in my eyes. Don't let the game's warning fool you. There is no additional post-game content other than a conversation with Pope. Despite implications, you cannot clear out all the hiss. You cannot 100% the game to access a true ending like in Arkham Knight. What you can do is wrap up some side missions. Mirror, mirror, on the wall. Which is the greatest side quest of them all? It's this one. The mirror is an altered item being experimented on in the Synchronicity Lab. We can't cleanse it if we can't access it, and so we have one of Control's few puzzles. Past the door in front of you is the mirror. On either side is three shutters, six total. We can see what the mirror reflects using cameras, and we can learn from a document that the path opens when the shutters are in the correct sequence. How do you figure it out? According to the experiment log, the mirror doesn't reflect reality perfectly. There are slight differences, and it's theorized that the mirror reflects a version of reality that it wants to be real. So, if the mirror wants itself to be accessed, then the correct sequence of shutters must be in the reflection. So it is. You would eventually come to this conclusion without the document, but I imagine most people thought to read the clues in the room. Of the three that exist, every one of them is just as good. Each is entirely diegetic, the location of clues and relevant items makes sense in the world. You gain information through keen observation until you have enough to make that leap that leads to the solution. That satisfying revelation. No puzzle is particularly challenging because the clues given in the world are always fairly straightforward, but each is immersive and just as fun as any good puzzle should be. So, what is it that the mirror wants? You step in and find out. Sure enough, everything is reversed. Text, even Jesse's speech. You can't do anything in the containment room, but there's something wrong about the synchronicity lab. If you look closer into the cubicles, there's someone inside, and it's you. Doppelgangers and mannequins? That's a combination from hell. Once you track down Mirror Jesse three times, she breaks free. Jesse versus S Edge is the battle we've all been waiting for. S Edge can use every ability you can launch, shield, the ground slam out of levitate, and of course the service weapon. You have to fight three versions of her, each gets harder. I'd say it's adequately challenging, but just for the idea alone, I love this encounter. What a fantastic side mission. Now, I know Control's story kinda sucks d but what you gotta understand is that it's actually really good. Contradictions are great, just ask the writers. What I mean is, the lore, the environment, the story you experience just through playing, that's this game's truest narrative strength. The plot is a joke, but you won't leave Control without loving its world. I want to spend time in the oldest house. It's like a modern Hogwarts, and that isn't invalid when judging a story. Time for a Dark Souls comparison, which I only use because most of us are familiar with the genre. Those games have very little plot and characters are intentionally hollow. But there's still a story to be found, because it's been painted for you in the world itself, sometimes literally. People still talk of its lore today. Control is no different. The oldest house is so interesting, it's so thoughtfully fleshed out, that it is a fantastic narrative vessel. This side mission simply took a single part of that world and expanded it into an experience. It'll stick with me forever. How do you judge a game with a story this good and a story this bad? I call it a mess and a masterpiece. I hope the DLC knows which side to put its focus. There's no reason to cover the other side quests, but know that bar Arisha's Sinister Six, they're all fantastic. I love the altered items in particular, each one creating those interesting gameplay scenarios that the campaign lacked. I'll never forget the traffic light that you have to obey to get in close. There's plenty of reason though to touch on the bosses. It is indeed true that the final fight of the game is a horde encounter, while its best unique boss is stuck inside a fridge, but I'm gonna chalk that up to the DMT. As long as you don't count Mr. Tomasi, who can go f himself, the other bosses are all well worth seeing, sometimes just for the seeing part. I also hope there's more of these in the DLC, perhaps in the line of the demon plant which encourages movement and has a wide range of attacks instead of the anchor, which you can make trivial by standing still. So, 
What's next for Control? I mean, we've done the side quests, the crappy ending has been more than made up for, what now? Well, this is where things get a little sour again. The answer's nothing. There's a puzzle in luck and probability you can do for an outfit, otherwise Control's finished. Which is strange, because the game already has features that could have culminated in a rich, addictive endgame experience. We have mods that given a goal could have you chasing the best possible build for Jesse. We have dynamic side quests that never stop generating. I struggle to understand why these are even in the game if they were going to be so pointless. Let me explain. Radiant side missions will pop up at random as you play, they're called Bureau Alerts. And what's special is, they're timed. In another game I'd hate it. But we're playing in the oldest house. The mad dash to get to the correct location in time is a lot of fun without objective markers, because you can shave several minutes off your time through your knowledge of the oldest house alone. And I love the way it makes the hiss feel like an ongoing threat. Problems pop up anywhere at any time, places you've been or places near them. It's a very immersive activity, but such simple problems keep it from its potential. A baboon could beat these in under 20 minutes. The feeling of being rushed is only felt the first time. Hiss nodes are 10 times easier than every other type. And the rewards are just pitiful. I was still being offered crappy mods even after I'd finished the game. Although you could argue that there's not a mod in this game that isn't crappy. Mods are simply buffs distributed as loot. Rarity tiers go up as the game goes on, maxing out at level 5, absolute. Problem is, the mod system is both boring and broken. Why in the name of f**k would I pick a mod that marginally reduces the energy cost of one ability, when I could get extra health, or just more energy? Why would I need reduced recoil for a shotgun? Did anyone think this through? I'd be forgiving if the mods were interesting upgrades that create new gameplay opportunities through alterations to the abilities and the service weapon. Rather, they are no more than percentage buffs. And of course, there's an inventory limit. Why can we only carry 24 personal mods? Is there any logical reason? Maybe, maybe not. Either way, it's annoying. Because you will frequently run out of space, requiring lengthy deconstructions each time. Truth is though, this is nothing MMOs don't do successfully. And that's because they have something to mod towards. They have content difficult enough to warrant chasing builds. They have an endgame, and Control could have had one too. Make the Radiant side quest that already exist tougher, put an awesome reward behind beating the hardest. I'd grind for that. An endless arena would surely be such a simple thing to program. All you'd need is a decent incentive, maybe a leaderboard, and bang, I'd still be playing Control today. A game like this doesn't need an endgame, but it's so close to having a good one. They've got two DLCs to make that final push, and that's all the content there is to cover. This video ended up being much longer than anticipated. But you know, I just can't stop thinking about Control. I want to believe. That's not just the X-Files tagline, it's the truth. I want to believe that behind all of this art, all of these stark colours and impossible places lies something meaningful. Control gets to unfairly abuse the benefit of being so intentionally vague. It can make me claw for some kind of message or theme, even when it seems evident there is none. What if Control has no message to accurately represent what it's like to see things that far beyond our understanding? Meaning is something we make, it's ours, it's human. How do you find that in other dimensions? What happens if you do? I've asked, and one of the answers I got was that we can imagine ideas as dots on a plane. Those dots tend to comfortably clump together within our personality. We're not meant to understand ideas that are very far from our comfortable clump. It is self-restriction, but what happens when knowing a truth is counterproductive to our survival? Ask nihilism. Should we know it then? And yet, we're in a better position in today's nihilistic society than we have ever been before. Suggesting that we should simply give up on trying to understand some things might comfort some, but be a killer of its own in the long run. There are things that ancient cultures were terrified of, that in today's society is mundane. We alter biology itself as we see fit, but the world didn't end. Can we know if there are some things that we shouldn't understand? Not until we understand them. And we will. There's nothing that'll stop us. If there's anything I do understand, is the control is an experience I'll never forget. Half a mess, half a masterpiece, and endlessly memorable. The one thing people seem to agree on is that we need more games like this. Not the 18th installment in a tired franchise, something new. A studio with the balls to step into the unknown. Control isn't a game designed to sell itself or DLC or microtransactions, it's a game designed to be a game. It's the result of passion, not deadlines and quotas. It's something every fan of video games should play. Thank you for watching. The first time I shouted this guy out, I was covering fear, so it's only appropriate to do it again now. Squid the Sid is back, ladies and gentlemen, with an excellent critique of Rage 2 and a remarkably interesting assessment of gaming on Linux. Check that out, I learned a lot. 
Of course, thanks also go out to the people who helped make this video possible. Lex Williams, Just Anima, Ludwig Salen, Leon Kattendahl, Holy Shift, Chance Tucker, Douglas Griffith, Combat Wombat, Sim, Noah B. Satterley, Juris Purins, Abby, L. Hudson, Rosa, Benjamin Carter, Bishop Nelson, John Lemley, Fabian Flack, Zachary Scott, and Dominic Jaworski. With every donation, video production is smoother and my life is easier. Thanks to everyone who's donated and anyone considering. But hey, if you're looking to spend your spare change on a game, I have just the one for you. This is so weird, but it is my head. <laughs> me, 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 me. I am the great mighty Pooh, and I'm going to throw my sh at you. A huge supply of tish comes from my chocolate starfish. How about some scat, you little twat? Do you really think you'll survive in here? You don't seem to know which creek you're in. Sweet corn is the only thing that makes it through my rear. How do you think I keep this lovely grin? Now I'm really getting rather mad or like a niggly tickly shitty little tag nut When I've knocked you out with all my bab I'm going to take your head and ram it off my butt Your butt My butt Your butt That's right, my butt Ugh. My butt Ugh. My butt <laughs> Ah, you passage squirrel, look what you've done I'm flushing, I'm flushing Oh, what a world, what a world who would have thought a good little squirrel like you could destroy my beautiful flagginess? Oh, I'm going! Oh! Ah! No! Ah! <laughs> now that's what I call a bowel movement.